QuickBooks Online 2024. New vendors set up and accounts payable beginning balances. Get ready and clear your mind because we don't overanalyze. We intuit with Intuit's QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation, continuing to lay down those foundational items necessary to do the normal data input process. The normal data input process consisting in part of entering financial transactions with the help and use of forms found in the new or plus button broken out by cycle, customer cycle, or sales cycle, vendor cycle, expense cycle, employees cycle, or payroll cycle. We then communicate with our customers, vendors, and employees with the help of the centers on the left, sales center or customer center, expenses center or vendor center, payroll center or employee center. When we set up those foundational items, the one-time things that are not as cyclical, they're often found in the cog button. We've looked at the your company, the lists. We're basically continuing on with the lists in this case, looking at the chart of accounts, which can also be found under the transactions, chart of accounts on the right. And we're also now adding the beginning balances to the chart of accounts, this time looking at the accounts payable beginning balances, which also could include the subledger or list of the vendors, the people that we pay for stuff, the people that we have to populate the forms with the expense form, check form, bill form, possibly the purchase order if we're using that form. If we go on to our worksheet over here, we are continuing on to imagine that we had a prior accounting system and we want to move into the new accounting system in QuickBooks Online. We want to pull in our beginning balances as of the end of the last year. We used the prior accounting system, in our case, 12-31-2023, so that we have everything set up going forward for January of 2024. Moving forward, notice that we don't have any income statement accounts. You will not, typically, if you're using this method and you're transferring over into the whole new current year because the income statement rolls out into the balance sheet. So we have a balance sheet that reconciles in basically journal entry type of format here, but we cannot just enter it as a journal entry because each account, as we've discussed, has its own special needs. We started out with the inventory, possibly the most difficult account because it has a subledger that we have to track. It's difficult, at least if we're tracking that subledger in QuickBooks so that we can add the inventory items. We then talked about the accounts receivable, which is also a little bit more difficult than just entering the balance of 20,500 because we need to know who we owe the 20,500 to, number one, and number two, we need to be able to pay or collect on the 20,500, tying out the receive payment to the open invoices. And if we had a journal entry, we wouldn't be able to do that. Accounts payable is what we're gonna do now because it's probably the next area of difficulty and because it's very similar to the accounts receivable. When we look at the accounts payable, I have to then think, well, can I just enter that as a journal entry that we owe people payables, uh, the 15,000? No, I can't do that. Why? Because one, the 15,000 might be consisting of multiple different vendors. So I need to know who I owe the money to so I can track who I owe the money to and then pay them uh, who I owe the money to, and two, then uh, if I enter that as a journal entry, when I pay off the journal entry, it's not gonna tie out to the bill. I need it to tie out internally with the forms that are designed to be used 
for the vendor side of things in QuickBooks. The accounts payable going up with the bill type form, going down with the pay bill type form. Those two things have to be in, in essence connected. So as we enter the accounts payable balance, we're thinking one, I need the accounts payable on the books so everything ties out on my balance sheet. But two, I'm also making sure that I have the vendors so I can pay them. And then also we're touching in on just simply uploading our vendors into the new accounting system. Now note that the vendors might be an area where you really can clean things up because oftentimes you don't need all that information for every vendor. Most of your vendors are just people that you paid for one-off things oftentimes. So if you've been in business for 10 years, you may have many vendors that you no longer pay anymore, but they're still in your prior accounting system because you paid them 10 years ago for one particular thing or something like that. Well, do you need to pull that person into your current system? Most likely not because you, it's going to clog up your system. So this is one of the areas where you can reduce the amount of, of bulk possibly in your system if you're using this method. The same happens to be the truth with the accounts receivable as well. You probably don't want to be pulling in a bunch of customers that you know are inactive and you're not using at this point. So with the payables then, if I, if I go over here, we would go into, uh, when we enter to a payable, you could add the vendors as you go, typically with expense forms, check forms, bill forms, these forms possibly going through the bank feeds. That's what normally happens when you start a new company file. You start paying people possibly with the bank feeds when you pay the telephone bill, the utility bill, the supplies bill. You add the vendors as you go, adding minimal amount of data, just the name that you need in order to assign the proper account and to pay the vendor. Uh, so, so if I go down to the vendors on the left, then we manage the payments of the vendors on the left in what I would call the vendor center. And then we're in the vendors over here. So note that if you're a small business and you're tracking vendors on a cached based system, then you're not going to be using this field as much most likely because again, you're just basically paying the vendors as the bills become due. But if you're in a system where you're where you have accounts payable that you're tracking and or possibly you're buying stuff from a uh, inventory, then you might want a lot more detail about the vendors, right? Especially if you're dealing with inventory, then your vendors are similar to the accounts receivable side of things. So remember when we thought about the receivables, we saw that some businesses might not need a whole lot of data about their receivables because they're selling one-time transactions. They might not have a lot of repeat business with particular customers. Uh, but other companies might do all of their business with repeat customers and therefore they really want to make sure they have a good relationship with all of all of their customers. Everyone wants a good relationship with the customers, but sometimes you need to build a more personal relationship of trust over a long period of time as opposed to a one-off sale. Uh, and well, on the vendor side, same kind of thing. A lot of times you might just be dealing with the phone company, big companies, you, all you need to know is who to pay. That's the only place you can go to get your electricity or whatnot, right? So it is what it is. Other vendors that you buy your inventory from or something like that, you might want a lot more information on, one, so that they can ship you the inventory and just from a technical standpoint, and two, because you need to build trust with those particular people. So you want to you want to have a lot more contact information in your system about them. It depends on what uh, industry that you are in. But if you have accounts payable, then of course you're tracking, you're at least tracking the bills and you have to then track when, when you're going to uh, owe the bills at a future point in time. Okay, so the process is basically similar to what we saw with the receivables. We could add them one at a time. So it says here is keep track of who owes you. There, we don't have any vendors. That's why we see this screen. Find all your vendors' contacts in one place. See how much you're spending by vendor. Keep track of money you owe each vendor. So we can import vendors here. We can add the vendor. Let's look at adding vendor just so we can see the fields. So if I tap through the fields, these are the fields that would be in place if we were to upload like we did with the customers in uh, uh, an import situation. So we have the company name. Notice that this is all you really need. That's why the asterisk is here. Vendor display name. Note also that if you are using bank feeds to pull in information to the bank feeds and then adding vendors as you go, 
it will not usually show like if you have the telephone company was called Edison, right? It's not going to show in the vendor display field the name. It's going to be in the bank memo or bank text. But you'll be able to find it and possibly copy and paste it into the proper place if you're using electronic transfer with the bank feeds and then you can add them as you go and that's the only information you really need to see who you're dealing with. Then you need to interpret, well, if I'm paying Edison, what's the account that I'm paying for? What, what am I paying them for? The telephone. Then you need to assign an account based on who you are paying. Okay, we'll talk about, about bank feeds more in a future presentation, but we have the title or in a future section or course. So we have the title, first name, middle name, last name, email. So these are not required, but like I say, if, these, if this is your actual people that you are buying inventory from constantly, then you're going to want this information. If they're shipping you stuff, then you're going to, and you're shipping them stuff possibly, or you're going to need the addresses, notes. Like I say, you don't need that for a lot of vendors, but if you, if you have vendors you're trying to accumulate a long-term relationship with, having some notes in there might be a very useful tool. Account number, routing number for uh, uh, payments, if you're paying them in that, uh, uh, in that format. Additional information, you've got the taxes, business ID, and track for 1099. Why is this useful? We talked, we'll, we'll deal with 1099s a little bit, but uh, the idea with a 1099 is in the United States, the government wants to make sure that everyone's obviously paying their taxes, and they're trying to make the large company responsible for the reporting of the small companies, kind of, I would say, like ratting out the small companies to make sure they're paying their taxes. Why would that be the case? Because large companies cannot fly under the radar. So the government's like, we know you guys made money and we're pretty comfortable you're going to pay us because you're, we're, we're, you're clearly on the radar, right? And so in order to be in good standing, we want you to be able to, to manage the taxes for the people that are not on the radar, meaning the, the, the employees and the smaller businesses, the sole proprietors. So that means that if you are taking on a vendor that is not incorporated, this is a general rules, they're not a C corporation, they're not an S corporation, they're a sole proprietorship or a contractor of some kind, a small person, then you might have to issue them a 1099 or if you're hiring them, you'd have to bring them on as an employee. The IRS tries to pretend like those two things have a distinct line between them, although there's in practice a lot of gray area. So if you, so then if they're, if they're a contractor, then you don't have to withhold like you would if they were an employee, but you still may have to issue them a 1099, which should be a fairly basic process, although it looks like they're trying to make that a little bit more uh, intense uh, to treat them more like an employee. I wouldn't be surprised if they force you to do withholdings at some point, not too far in the future for contractors, but we'll see what happens. But that would be with that for you track it if they're not, that's the general idea. Okay. So then you and uh, what would you need to collect? You'd need to collect their social security number. If they're a sole proprietor, they're not going to want to give you that normally. So they should have an EIN number. Even if they're a sole proprietor without employees, you can tell them get an EIN number. You can get it at the IRS website. So you don't have to give people your social security number. If not, if they won't give you that, you don't do business with them typically because then your head's on the chopping block for not complying with the IRS by sending them the 1099 with the information. Okay. Or you might have to do withholdings, which will upset them. Okay. So expense rates, billing rates, hours, uh, payment terms. So these are going to be the, the terms which are not as important on the vendor side as the customer side, because they're going to be set by the person giving you the bill as opposed to you on, on, on our side. So we're going to have to put the due date in most likely manually accounting default expense category, uh, choose uh, account. So if this is, a, I could, as I add the vendor, put the default accounts in here. And that's kind of pretty nice. I don't think most people do it that way because what most people do is they use the bank feeds. And then as they have the bank memos come through the bank feeds, they assign the vendor and then they make a bank rule, which will allocate to the proper account. Or if you're, if you're entering the transactions with an expense form or bill form or check form outside of bank feeds, we usually kind of memorize the last transaction. 
so that it'll pull up the account number of the last transaction helping us to be consistent. However, this is another method you could use and that particular vendor, you can assign the, the account that you want it to go to. If you're using bank feeds, I like the bank rules better because you could get more specific on the bank rules as to which account you want something to be assigned to because possibly if you order something from like a supply shop, then maybe you want large purchases to be treated differently than small purchases, possibly going to a fixed asset versus a supplies. You can do that with the, with the bank rules. You can't really do that here. Okay, so opening balances. This is something that you would never use after you first set up the accounts. It's the thing that we will use this time and this time only. So QuickBooks will create a transaction, most likely entering a bill form because the bill form is the form that increases accounts payable. If you put something in here, the other side most likely go into an expense account. Uh, and so we'll see that. So I'm going to, I'm going to close this back out for now. Do you want to leave without saving? I'm going to say yes. So there is that. Now, if we were to upload a list of vendors, which again, uh, it, I would take the opportunity to clean up your vendors. I, I would not just download 500 vendors from my prior accounting system and then upload them all up here because then again you have all those vendors that you probably don't need i would either just upload the the ones that have a balance in them and then start new creating new vendors as i go as i enter expense forms and bill forms or i would look for only the vendors that had activity in them recently and clean out all the all the excess and pull them in or possibly just add the vendors that i really want a strong relationship with that has a lot of detail in them, such as our suppliers, just some things to think about. But if I was to import them, we can import uh, this way. So I can select this one. We have our import screen. Now remember that in the in I'm going to close that out. The other way you can get there is to go to the to the cog up top tools and import data. So I just want to point this out in case QuickBooks eliminates one of these two methods. They just make a change. You can um, have the vendors here, but I think it makes sense to have it in the vendor center. So let's check that out. If I go back on over to the expenses and I go into the import here, there it is. First time importing vendors, all your vendor information must be in one file. The top row of your file must contain a header title for each column of information. Vendor name is the only required field. So it says you can select either a CSV file or Excel file. So this time they've expanded it again from what was in the products and services like they did with the customers having either an Excel or CSV file, CSV file being a comma delimited file typically opened in Excel, but stripped of all the detail. I would download their information just like we did with the customers. If you're tip, if you're looking to use this method and then uh, open up your, your data that you pull, that I would download your data from whatever your accounting system was to Excel or some other spreadsheet, which is typically easy to do, and then copy over each of the columns here to the proper columns in the same fashion as we did with the customers. Same idea, same concepts could be a problem in that you might have a situation where, for example, you have, you have like a name with a first name space last name, which the other system breaks out between two cells or you might have one system say it's last name comma first name and in this one they want first last and uh in first last or something like that or you might run into a situation where like the whole address is is in one is in one cell street city zip uh state zip might be broken out differently we talked a little bit about techniques to deal with that when we did the customer area. So if you want some techniques to say, well, what if I need to combine this together in one cell? We talked about this, that when we said importing customers and what if I had it all in one cell and I wanted to break them out into multiple cells? We talked about that a little bit in when we dealt with the same kind of issue with customers. So you can look at that if you want to, or you can look online and, and see tricks to deal with whatever you're doing. Just say, okay, if, if what I need to do is take this and break it out into two cells, type into Excel, how do I break out uh, uh, first name, last name into, in, type into your favorite search, first name, last name, or possibly YouTube into two cells 
or, or something like, or, or convert it to a comma kind of thing, and you get, you'll get ideas about it. All right, but we're not gonna do that here because we did that with the customer side. And what we're gonna do is imagine that that whole amount here, uh, 15,000 is coming from just one vendor. And so I'm not gonna import it again because it's a similar process we'll, as the customers and as the products and services. So I'm just going to uh, uh, just set up a new vendor. So I'm just gonna add a vendor and we're just gonna say, I'm gonna say the vendor name is just gonna be Epiphone. Epiphone is our vendor. And that's all I'm going to put. Maybe I'll put that in the company name as well, Epiphone. But this is the only required field. And I'm going to go down here and just say all I need is that opening balance, which I would only use when I first input the data. I'm going to say, what was it, 15,000? Uh, 15,000, okay. So 15,000. And the date is going to be 12-31-2-3. 12-31-2-3, last date of the prior year. And that's important because it's going to make a journal entry, possibly and most likely with an expense form, which will increase the accounts payable, the other side go into an expense, and that expense will roll into net income, uh, which will roll into the, to the, to the equity section. So let's save it and check it out. So there it is. So if I close this out, what happened? It put Epiphone in here. So now I have Epiphone as a vendor. If I select the drop down, it says create bill, create uh, expense, I can make a payment. If I go into Epiphone, you can see what it did. It made a bill form. Remember that a bill form, by the way, is, is something different in common terms language than in QuickBooks. In common term language, you might say that you bill your customers. But a bill form in QuickBooks means that the bill, you're being billed by the vendor, like the telephone company. And not only that, you didn't pay off the bill. If you paid off their bill, then what you would enter is not a bill. You would enter an expense form or a check form. But if you entered their bill as a bill into the system, you would be increasing the accounts payable. So a bill form for QuickBooks is much more restrictive of a term. It means that you're entering a, a, a vendor invoice or bill that will increase the accounts payable, right? So bill increases accounts payable for QuickBooks. Okay, so if I go into that, what did it do? It made a bill for Epiphone, uh, da, 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 here's the date, and then down here, just dump the other side into other miscellaneous expense. Now, if you want it to go to equity itself, like opening balance, you could change this account to opening balance. I don't care though that it went into an expense account because we entered it as of the prior year, it will roll into equity in the current year and the income statement will refresh. So that's fine, I'm good with that. I'm gonna close that out. And then I can see that I can also track that bill in the expenses over here, which tracks the transactions and in the bills, uh, uh, which tracks the transaction. We have to be in the unpaid bills and the unpaid bills. Okay, so there's that. So now let's open up our reports and see what it did to the report. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down reports on the left hand side in our favorites let's right click on the balance sheet and open a new tab right click the profit and loss open in a new tab go into that middle tab that we just opened close up the hand boogie let's bring it back to 2023 010123 tab 123123 123123 tab okay so accounts receivable we did that last time inventory we did that last time here's the ap uh, at 15,000, that matches what we have here. That looks good. Let's go into it, see what it did. If we go into it, then of course, we see that it made a bill. We didn't enter a bill, we just entered that opening balance. It made a bill because the bill form is the form that increases accounts payable, allowing us then to tie the bill to the payment that we expect to happen in the future. Where did it put the other side? Dumped it into net income. The net income comes from the income statement. Let's go to the income statement, close up the boogie, and range change 010123 to 123123 and run it. So now we have, it just dumped it into this random account, miscellaneous expense. You might say, well, that's not what we bought. We bought something else. It should, it should go into like telephone or whatever we bought or inventory. But that's okay because it's in the prior year 
I don't care what it was. Prior years closed. The income statement is closed. We already did our income taxes. It's over. That's fine. Uh, all we need to have is the balance sheet to be correct generally going forward. The income statement will reset. If I need to go back to the income statement back to last year, which is already closed, then we can look at the prior accounting system. If I go up to the next date here, 010124 to 123124, the odometer resets for our new journey. Nothing's in it. No, so that's what we want because that's fine. So if I go to the balance sheet, that also means that everything that's in net income is not even an account. This isn't a real account. It's going to close out to retained earnings. Let's check that out. 010124 to 123124. Run it. Closes out to retained earnings. So the plan is in effect. Uh, everything's getting dumped into retained earnings. We will clean up retained earnings at the end of this process. All I need to do is make all these balances work. If I make all of these balances work, then retained earnings will have be everything else will dump out and retained earnings will end up at this 77, 896, possibly in some strange accounts, opening balance, retained earnings have net income, but we'll consolidate it all together to whatever we need it to be retained earnings uh, or a capital accounts if it's a partnership or the sole proprietorship if it's a if it's a sole proprietor will do that uh, after we get we get everything worked out so that looks like it works now obviously if I go back to this first tab just to remind us that if I go down to my expenses when I pay off the expenses when I when I go to say the vendor here uh, hold on, let's just go into the bills, something. If I go in here and I say that we're going to pay them, uh, uh, or let's just do it this way. If I go to the plus button and I say I'm going to pay the bills, then now I can pay it off. So we can see that item in here. Notice if I entered it with a journal entry, it would be difficult for me to go in here and tie it up. I probably still could do it but it wouldn't exactly it doesn't look exactly right right when because the bill is the form that ties out to the pay bill okay let's open up a sub ledger or, or the trial balance i'm going to or no we need we need a sub ledger let's go to the reports down here close up the ham boogie so we have some more space on the dance floor to, to boogie and then we're going to go down to uh who owes you so here's the sub ledger balance sheet uh vendor vendor accounts payable aging accounts payable aging and then vendor balance detail let's open that one right click and open a new link so just to note this is the sub ledger closing this one up here let's make it as a let's all dates is fine so there it is so we only have one person that we owe but just to note that the sub ledger should list all the vendors that we owe money to broken out by vendor 15,000 that should tie out to what's on the balance sheet the 15,000 now oftentimes we track that internally and in what I would call the vendor center over here but the vendor center oftentimes doesn't give you that balance so people don't fully understand that the vendor center should tie out to what's on the sum of all the outstanding balances over here should tie out to what's on the balance sheet and you can see that clearly if you run a report for the sub ledger breaking out everything you owe uh, by vendor all right let's open up the trial balance i'm going to open up the ham boogie again and we're going to well, let's go to the first tab open up the ham boogie and let's go to the reports close up the ham boogie so we can boogie and then we're going to go down and the trial balance by the way is way at the bottom down here under the account let's just find it this way right click on the trusty tb trial balance open link in a new tab and just check it out this way this is what we've constructed thus far closing up the hand boogie wrap back to 0301123 oh, tab 1231.23 tab run it so we can be refreshed with a nice run a nice jog so there we have it so now we've we put the ar in there the uh inventory the accounts payable opening balance equity and then these two are income statement accounts so note if i net those two out we can see because i'm in two, uh 23 that those two accounts will net out right Twenty thousand five hundred minus the fifteen thousand. that's the five thousand five hundred if i go to the balance sheet 
and I bring this back to, to 03, 01, 01, 23, tab, 12, 31, 23, tab, and run that one, that's what they put in here. It's not in retained earnings yet. They put another account, net income, not exactly proper, but that's how most online accounting softwares work to try to show you that link. It should be in retained earnings, right? <laughs> but but they put, and then if I go over here, and then I go back to the prior year, 01, 01, 23, tab, 12, 31, 23, tab, and run it to refresh it, there's the difference. They they dumped the, 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 the AR, other side of it, with an invoice into 20,500 income. They dumped the other side of the AP, expenses, into f expenses, 15,000. The difference is 5,500, which is on the balance sheet, 5,500. The trial balance will show you the, the all of the balance sheet accounts down to here you can imagine this kind of being equivalent to net income before the current year and then it gives you the detail of the income statement including revenue and expenses the net of revenue and expenses if you subtract out revenue minus expenses being net income so that's how you can get this nice short short document that shows the balance sheet on top of the income statement what happens if I go one year up to the current year that we're going to start doing business? On the balance sheet, this net income is going to roll into retained earnings. So I'm going to say 010124, 123124, run it. The, the, the net income rolled into retained earnings. On the income statement, it's going to all go away because we're resetting the odometer for the new trip so that we can count our progress from zero. 01012412. 3124, boom, nothing's in it. That's what we want. What if we go to the trial balance? What's going to happen? These two are going to go away and it's going to show retained earnings at 5,500. It's just going to squish up all of the income statement accounts to that one number, right? So I'm going to go back up here and say 010124, 123124, run it, boom, there's the 5,500 still in balance. That being in balance, by the way, is the double entry accounting system working, which you can also represent in a formula basis, although this is cleaner. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. Let's just check that out as we're going. Assets are 20,500 plus 2896 are 23,396. Liabilities and equity. Who has claim to those assets? Third party people have claim, 15,000 like the bank or our vendors, plus our claim as the owner, 2896 plus 55500. Five, zero, zero. There's the 23396. That's how it's being represented on the balance sheet. So we have assets equal liabilities plus equity. Uh, the other way you can represent this is, is, of course, assets minus liabilities. So 20,500 plus 2896 are the assets minus the liability 15,000 comes out to the equity 8,396 which is what these two add up to 5500 plus 2896 8,396 you can see that on the balance sheet if I look at this accounting equation and just say okay I'm going to look at these bottom two and just look at I'll just do the math my algebra I'm just going to say, well, if assets equal liabilities plus equity, that means 23,396 assets minus liabilities, 15,000 equals equity of 8,396. So the balance sheet longer, more cumbersome, a lot of subtotals, actually you know, less easy to read and navigate through, uh, and the income statement, then actually a trial balance in a lot of ways. Trial balance clean, streamlined, but... Most people don't understand debits and credits. That's why you use the trial balance to do the work, and then you convert it to a format that people can read the accounting equation. But both the debits and credit format of the trial balance and the accounting equation format of the balance sheet and its component of retained earnings, the income statement, are reflections of the same concept of the double entry accounting system.